Tonight on Greater Boston, Joe Biden's approval ratings have been dropping for months, with low marks on everything from his handling of Ukraine to the rising cost of just about everything. So is there anything he can do to turn things around, or will it be a Republican blowout in the midterms? Plus, a look at the millions of Americans providing unpaid caregiving for aging or ailing loved ones and the types of support they need now more than ever. With seven months to go until midterm elections, Joe Biden's approval ratings, or lack thereof, are starting to raise some warning bells for the Democratic Party. Depending on the survey, anywhere from 38 to 42 percent of us approve of the job Biden's doing these days at or near a record low for his presidency. The reason? Does James Carville's 30-year-old answer still ring true? Is it? The economy is stupid because even with the fastest job growth in almost four decades, inflation and the rising costs of fuel, food, housing, and as I just said, just about everything else are understandably getting all the attention. And while some Democrats believe there's still time to turn things around, others are predicting a biblical disaster. I'm joined now by Jennifer Rubin. She's an opinion columnist for The Washington Post. Jim Puzangera is a reporter in the Boston Globe's Washington Bureau. Jim and Jennifer, thanks so much for your time. Nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Uh, uh, Jennifer, starting with you, if the midterms were today, and I know they're not, if the midterms were today a blowout for the GOP in Congress, is that fair? It is certain that they would lose substantial votes. I think there's a real question because, unfortunately, we have so few competitive seats, how many could conceivably be at risk. But obviously, if the differential gets to be so big, yes, it could be dozens of seats. Could you explain, Jennifer, you mentioned the enthusiasm gap, gap which is gaping, if that's not repetitive, 20 point. Could you explain in favor of the Republicans? Explain what that means to people, please essentially is an indicator of who's going to actually show up. Republicans generally have an advantage in midterm elections. They have very reliable voters who tend to be older, uh, white, um, and they show up come heck or high water. Um, Democrats traditionally have a problem turning out their voters. And if they're not enthusiastic to begin with, that problem becomes even more acute. Jim, uh, other than the usual midterm anti-incumbency and obviously inflation, as I just mentioned, what else is driving this in your estimation? Um, well, I think I think as you said, it's it's the economy, stupid. And to be more specific, it's it's inflation. I mean, um, inflation hits everybody. Um, inflation is at a four-decade high. Um, it's continuing to go up. Um, you had. The war in Ukraine is exacerbating the situation, and that's hitting everybody. They see it. They see it when they go to the grocery store. They see it when they fill up their car at the gas station. Even when they don't have to fill up their car, they see the numbers going up on the gas station signs when they drive by. And that is a huge liability for, for President Biden. You can see it in, in the polling and where people put inflation in the economy well above Ukraine or any other issue as the most important thing to them. Well, you know, Jim, uh, uh, both the Biden administration and Democrats in general are saying it's all about the messaging. And I know, as you mentioned, uh, it's Putin's price hike. Uh, blame Putin for the gas hike. Uh, it, one, is that fair? And two, does it really matter? Um, well, um, yes, I, I think it is fair. The prices, gas prices were starting to go down. Inflation obviously has been a problem since um, last spring. Um, but things were starting to um, slow down. Gas prices were actually trending down until the Russian troops started amassing on the Ukraine border, and that sent um, prices up, and they've continued to go up. So you can blame that, and, and gas prices have a an effect on all other kinds of products, groceries, sure. anything that has to be um, taken by truck. So there is truth to it, but ultimately it doesn't matter because um, people are going to blame the party in power for, for this. And inflation was a problem before um, the war in Ukraine. So the Democrats are in charge in Washington, and they're going to get the blame for this. You know, Jennifer, uh, one other issue Jim mentioned in passing the war and the numbers for Biden on this are what I saw this weekend, 45 percent approval. I'd have to say, and I hope this is an objective position, if the president has handled anything masterfully, I would say 
it's the coalescing of our uh, allies uh, in an attempt to both support Ukraine without going in directly and to oppose Russia. Does he get no credit for that because people don't care about that kind of issue when the prices at home are ripping through their wallets? I think the inflation problem casts a unrosy glasses over the entire yeah. uh, political scene that they're dissatisfied and therefore everything he does um, is insufficient or bad or a distraction from what they think he should be doing. He really is in somewhat of a no-win situation. And of course, the problem is made worse by the fact that Biden really doesn't control inflation at this point. That's largely a function of the Federal Reserve. But the president cannot, as a political matter, tell voters, it's not my problem, or I can't do anything sure. about it. And therefore, he is struggling to appear engaged, to appear to address the problem with stunts, if you will, like re uh, releasing uh, barrels of oil from the petroleum reserve. Um, and so he's trying mightily to solve a problem that he really can't. And he's going to have to rely on Jerome Powell and the Fed to bring down prices without throwing us into a recession. Well, I think in fairness, though, the oil reserve thing is not a stunt. It's just as I guess it's fair to say it has modest impact. But at the same time, it's upsetting climate activists who saw this as an opportunity to put fossil fuel in the rearview mirror. At the same time, Joe Biden's urging people to use their permits to do fracking and drilling on federal lands. Can I run by both of you a couple of things when I was preparing to see you today that in my estimation might change the dynamic? I don't know. Starting with you, Jennifer, the gutting of Roe v. Wade in June, let's say, by the Supreme Court, does that drive people to the Democrats? Yeah, I think we're headed for a um, culture class of all culture classes, depending upon how far the Supreme Court goes. It's not just abortion that they are considering right, right now, although that is certainly a high profile issue. They're looking at guns, they're looking at the use of race in college admissions. And across the board, there may be a very conservative Supreme Court that from the point of view of many Americans, sets things back uh, a number of decades, legally and practically in their lives. Does that change roads? And that roads? could really change. It could. And it depends upon how extreme the results are. And it, it depends upon how Democrats are able to present that to voters um, and what they say they can do about it to prevent their lives from changing. Jim, how about January 6th? The hearings are supposedly going to start in May. Uh, let's assume they're as damning as at least they appear uh, to be likely to be. To me, is will they matter to voters, or is this another, I can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and no one will give a damn? Yeah, well, as, as, you, as you indicated, the, the hearings are more about Trump. And I think we've seen from midterm elections, midterms tend to be more about issues. The, the Democrats took the majority in 2018 because they focused on issues. So I think the January 6th hearings will reverberate in the 2024 presidential race, particularly if Trump is running. But for the midterms, I think it will be more about um, the economy, um, inflation. That's the message that the I, Republicans I, are trying to hit. Jim, I know that's the, the historical rule, but if you have a former president who is in locked total control of that party, uh, I think it's fair to say, or virtually total control, is borderline felonious uh, in the minds of not just Democrats, but at least one judge and others. That doesn't trickle down into midterm votes? I, I think it could in the Senate. I, and that's part of the concern Mitch McConnell has raised. There are a number of very Trumpy um, Senate candidates in, in Republican primaries. And so if you had in, in, in a state like Pennsylvania or Missouri, um, North Carolina, where you had someone who was very, very closely aligned with Trump, I think that could spill over. But in the House races, I, I don't think it's going to be much of a factor um, unless it's someone who was particularly involved in the January 6th um, activities. And, and most of those people are, are not in competitive seats. And by the way, Jennifer, on the Trump front, I think, I think it's fair to say, uh, based on your columns, you don't think that Trump... Uh, will drive people to Democrats 
but may suppress Republican votes because of the rotten candidates he's endorsed in some cases. Is that a fair summary of your position? Well, again, I don't think the Trump um, factor is much in play in the midterms. Okay. Um, I think to the extent that he has played a hand in picking some real doozies as candidates <laughs> in some of these swing states, he may hobble his um, party. And um, it would be ironic if he weighs in to push certain candidates, and those turn out to be the candidates that deprive Mitch McConnell once more of the Senate majority. You know, uh, the couple of factors that I mentioned to you that I thought could have an impact on this trend away from the Democrats, the abortion decision, the January 6th hearings, they're not controlled by Biden or the Democrats. One thing that it seems to me matters a lot that Joe Biden does control, even if he says legally he may not, are student loans. Uh, candidate Biden promised to do something about student loans, albeit at a lower level, 10 grand, than the people like Elizabeth Warren and Ayanna Presley from Massachusetts want at 50 grand. They say he has unilateral power to change it. He says he's not sure he does. Uh, this pause, Jim, ends at the end of August. It seems to me he's signing his own political death warrant if he does nothing uh, in terms of loan forgiveness on this front. Am I overstating things? No, I think that, that there is a, um, a problem with him with younger voters on that issue. And I think that's why you've seen him extending the pause without pulling the trigger. As you said, he believes that Congress needs to act and he's trying to, to string this out. I wouldn't be surprised if he extends that pause again so that it's not ending right before the election. Um, but he seems very hesitant to go ahead with the action, the executive action, that a lot of people, a lot of uh, influential people in Congress, um, uh, Chuck Schumer is one of the people who is very strongly supportive of this, along with Elizabeth Warren and others. Um, Biden just doesn't seem to want to go there, but I think he also does not want this to, um, this, the loans to, the repayments have to start um, heading right into election season. Yeah, we only have 30 seconds left, Jennifer, but my assessment of another pause through the elections is it's worth nothing. It will just remind young voters that the promised forgiveness never happened. I think it's not a winning issue, whichever way they go. Listen, most people are not college uh, educated voters at all, so they may resent him doing anything for these people um, at a time where inflation is a problem. So I think all he can do is mitigate the damage from this issue at this point. Jim Puzangera and Jennifer Rubin, thanks so much for your thoughts. Appreciate it. Thanks. Nice to be here. COVID has made a lot of things harder over the past couple of years, and near the top of that list, caring for loved ones who need it most. Even in pre-pandemic times, many unpaid caregivers work the equivalent of a full-time job, providing help to ailing or aging family members. Now, as the Boston Globe recently highlighted, the roughly 20% of working adults who comprise this invisible backbone of society is increasingly being pushed to the edge of what is possible and healthy. It's a reality my guests know all too well. Perry Beltre cares for her mother in their shared home in Lynn, and Alexandra Drain, who's done some caregiving of her own, is the co-founder and CEO of Archangels, an advocacy group with roots here in Boston. Alex and Perry, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Alex, uh, ARP says, there. I, the number, I had did a double take, 53 million unpaid caregivers in the country, a million in Massachusetts alone. Who are these people? Can you paint a picture of the typical person in this situation? Yeah, absolutely. They're everyone you would expect and everyone you would not expect as well. In fact, the latest study that we were part of as of COVID, actually the number is higher. It's 43% of adults across the U.S. are in this role. One in four millennial, one in five are Gen Z. So it's not the picture of the 46 year old woman caring for her mom, although she is, there's a far greater population. And the job is intense. It is another job. And we're hoping people can get support in that job. My understanding, even though it goes across the board, Alex, my, my understanding is it particularly falls on the shoulders of women, people of color, those over 50. Is that a, is that a fair characterization? 
You know, I know that was that was absolutely true before COVID. I think as of COVID, we are seeing, in addition to those populations, it's also falling on younger, um, younger individuals. So folks, first generation, second generation, multi-generation households, sandwich generation households, yeah. where this incredible amount of care is being sort of split out across the family in order to do the amount of work that has to get done. Perry, it sounds like Alex is talking about you. Can you describe what you and your sister have been doing? Um, yes. Uh, so I started smiling because it has even affected my nephews who are 14 and 15. When we need a buffer so that we could go do something, they help out as well. So um, we have a rotation where um, my sister and I, I do about 30, 30 to 45 hours a week. She does about 30 to 40 hours a week. And um, my, our brothers assist when they can. And even, as I said, my my nephews, whenever they're around, they may cover and help my mom out for two hours so that we could do things. It's an all-encompassing, always exhausting labor of love. So 30 to 45 hours taking care of your mother, just your share. You have a job in addition to this, correct, Perry? <laughs> Correct. I actually just walked out of the courthouse and um, I've been here since nine o'clock and I didn't get to make it to my office for this. Um, just to go to show you that it's we're, I'm running from one thing to another. Um, I work 40 to 55, 60 hours, depending on a case or my needs. And then because of the overnight shift that we do and my weekend hours with my mother, it's another 35 to 45 hours. Do you, is a nursing home something you even you and your siblings consider or no? No, um, that's not even um, uh, an option. Um, it's cultural, it's duty, it's moral. Um, that's not even an option. Alex, what you know, you could see it in Perry's face. I hope she doesn't take this the wrong way. The stress, the fatigue. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a financial burden. Let me read one paragraph from the Globe story. This is data thanks to the Family Caregiver Alliance. Those over the age of 50 who leave the labor force are estimated to be losing out on more than 300 grand in wages, benefits, retirement funds over their professional lifetimes. People of color whose communities were hit hard by the pandemic also become caregivers a decade earlier on average than white caregivers. In addition to the financial burden, which is obviously immense, fewer hours or no hours at the uh, workplace. What are the other kinds of burdens that these unpaid caregivers experience, Alex? Well, it's an extraordinary toll on your own mental health, right? I mean, we have, there's a metric that we use at Archangels called the Caregiver Intensity Index, and it is a two and a half minute quiz. It puts you in the green, yellow, or red. If you're in the red, you're having the highest level of intensity. Mm -hmm. Before COVID, about 8% of us were in the red. As of COVID, it was 24%. Um, in the last month, that number has jumped to 29%. And what's interesting is if you are in the red, 91% are struggling with either anxiety, depression, and or suicidal ideation. So what you need is the equivalent of a red phone, right? We're hoping that employers can step up and actually provide some of this support so beautiful souls like yourself um, can be getting more home care, more navigation assistance, more ability to get access to a social worker or someone to help with your own own mental condition. By the way, when Alex was talking about beautiful souls like yourself, believe me, she was not talking about me. She was talking <laughs> about Perry. I want to be totally clear. You know, Alex, staying with you for a second, I'm so glad you brought up the employer thing. You know, uh, hopefully a motivation for an employer to help would be morality, decency, humanity. Even if they don't give a damn about any of those things, we all know about the labor shortage. Part of the reason for the labor shortage is what people like Perry and millions of others are doing. So isn't it in their economic self-interest to come to the aid of their workers who are in this kind of a mess? Yes, it is, absolutely. And I just wanna give a shout out to the state of Massachusetts because actually, um, we are a state where a group of employers have formed called the Mass Caregiver Coalition, where they are specifically stating this is an invisible backbone. This is a workforce that we need to be able to be present um, at work in order to keep the economy running in the Commonwealth. So I do believe there's finally attention by employers towards this issue. You know, Perry, I assume most viewers know that uh, Joe Biden originally proposed 12 weeks of paid family leave for things like this, then four, and then it disappeared. The state a year or so ago did do up to 12 weeks of paid family leave in certain circumstances to take care of a, a, a relative who is, is ill. Are you able to access any 
support, financial benefits, that sort of thing to help you in this mess? Me personally, no, because I'm also my own um, employer. I have my own law firm. Uh -huh. I have employees. Um, and so if I'm not there to, to bring in the revenue, then I can't. It's just, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. I mean, I'm, I'm eligible in the sense that I'm an employee of my firm, but um, as far as like the, the Massachusetts paid leave, but no. How about your sister or either of your brothers? So my sister, um, as the article states, she's a professor at Bentley. Yeah. Um, she's her, this is I think her second full, uh, full uh, semester year. And so it's not, it's not tenable. It's not feasible. It's similar to what was in the article. We are foregoing um, career opportunities, upward mobility, lateral moves because of um, our obligations to take care of our parents. And um, myself and my siblings, we would do it in a heartbeat. So if yeah. it means I'm making 20, 30, 40, 50 grand less a year, I wouldn't think twice about it, but that it doesn't come with consequences. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it is what it is. Alex, you're quoted uh, on your website, the Archangel website, as saying underutilized resources exist to support them, w meaning that, well, obviously underutilized means what it means. What are those kinds of things? I don't mean specific names, but types of things that might be available to the Perrys of the world and the other million people doing something like what she's doing in our state. Yeah, well, I'm going to answer that two ways. One, I hope any employers that are listening, recognizing the skill set of a Perry, you should be recruiting unpaid caregivers as fast as you can mm. because they are resourceful, yeah. because they are multitaskers, because they are innovators, right? I mean, this is a workforce that is highly talented, even though it's invisible. If you go to Mass Options or the Mass Family Caregiver Support Program, for example, which is funded by the state of Massachusetts, social workers help with navigation, help with getting access to home care right? These are the sorts of resources that exist. Most employers have, or many, have an employee assistance program. The challenge is unpaid caregivers don't know they exist because guess what? Perry, I'm guessing before this, you didn't think of yourself as an unpaid caregiver, right? You're just a daughter. Absolutely. And so what happens is when employers are offering support, they say, hey, caregivers, we can support you. And the vast majority of caregivers who need the most support are like, what? What's that? That's not me. And so employers need to change their language, use language people understand, and then crosswalk people over to these resources. Perry, we only have a minute left. Do you hope that there's a, a light at the end of this tunnel for you and your siblings? Or is your attitude, this is an obligation, responsibility for somebody I love, and I'm just going to grin and bear it? No, it's, I think it's twofold. So my mother is a patient at Dana Faber and Brigham. She's at the best place possible. Um, and they support us as they can. We're in a situation where you have a, my mom is not elderly and she's not, she doesn't meet certain age requirements That's for right. certain assistance. So we do hope that there's an opportunity for um, uh, some change as to people who are frail and or severely uh -huh. disabled. Um, but it's it's a two-way street. I'd like more help, but I, I would never change my circumstances in, far, in as much as helping her. I'd like to sleep a little bit more, but she's we're here for her. It's pretty clear to me that you are here for her, you and your siblings. Uh, Perry and Alex, I really appreci appreciate your time, and good luck with what you're both doing. I appreciate it. That's it for tonight. Please come back tomorrow. The first black doctor to head the Journal of the American Medical Association, Dr. Kirsten Bibbins Domingo, joins me on the challenge of confronting racism in medicine. Plus, former Homeland Security official Julia Kayam on her terrific new book, The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in the Age of Disasters. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thank you for watching. Please stay safe. Hey folks, Edgar B. Herbert III here from GBH's Curiosity Desk, where you ask questions and I find answers. Today we're at the famed Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where thanks to a question from New Hampshire's Lorraine Von Snyder, we are literally chasing rainbows. My question is, why are the rainbows that I see outside after a rainstorm always a perfect arc? Rainbows are, of course, one of nature's most charming tricks of light, and light is exactly what scientist Matthias Kohl spends his days pondering. In order for a rainbow to appear in the sky, you need three ingredients, so to speak, sunlight, raindrops, and you. And as Kohl explains, all three have to be in a very particular spot for the magic to happen. So the sun has to be behind you. Okay. That's the first thing, there's sun behind you. 
Then there has to be water in the atmosphere in front of you. And that's usually when it rains, you get the condition, right? And then um, what you also want to do is you want to look at the right spot. These positions are critical because of the two phenomena responsible for the appearance of a rainbow. A couple of old friends you might remember from middle school, refraction and reflection. Refraction is responsible for a rainbow's colors. When sunlight enters a raindrop, it bends. White light, like sunlight, is comprised of a spectrum of colored light. Now, each color is at a slightly different wavelength and bends at a slightly different angle when it enters the droplet. All of a sudden, we get the splitting of colors, uh, where the reds and the oranges and the greens and the blues go in slightly different directions. After the light enters the raindrop and is split into its component colors, a small portion of it reflects off the back and heads in a new direction. With each color now on a slightly different path, it refracts one more time as it's leaving the droplet and heads back down toward the Earth at a very precise angle. 40 degrees for the red, about 42 degrees for the violet, with the other colors in between. And that's just one raindrop! All of this is happening at an incredible scale, with literally billions of rays of light hitting billions of raindrops. It happens in every raindrop, as long as it sees the ray of sun, uh, it will do that refraction, reflection, refraction thing. But if you're not standing in the right position, you will not see this by most of the raindrops. But if you are in the right position, that magic angle between 40 and 42 degrees, there will be raindrops galore, throwing innumerable beams of distinct red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet light right at you. And the raindrops that are at that perfect angle relative to the sun and you form a distinct shape. All the droplets that are on this arc are going to send the light in the right direction for me yeah. to catch it. So we have to think about it three-dimensionally, yeah. right? So yeah. it's like this. Exactly. And my elbows kind of my eyes in Your this elbows scenario, would be your right? eyes in the scenario, yeah. exactly. You can think of it like a cone, with you at the point and the rainbow appearing along the circumference of the base. Now, as for why the entire circumference doesn't light up like a rainbow, well, the ground gets in the way. If you could get up high enough so that there's a lot of rain below your feet, well, Cole says, imagine you're Jack on a beanstalk. And as he climbs up, this arc would actually shift with him, but extend further and further below and start to actually, once it's in half arc, start to arc back on itself. And as he climbs higher and higher, this arc might close. And all of a sudden you don't have an arc, but you have a circle. A rain circle. A rain circle. Not a rainbow anymore, a rain circle. And if you think rain circles are cool, consider this. All of those individual raindrops that are making the rainbow that you see are unique to your position. And they're changing constantly, moment to moment. So forget about leprechauns and pots of gold. The real magic is in the science. And the fact that any time you see one, you are literally standing in the center of your own personal rainbow. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and perhaps most importantly, let me know what you are curious about. Because no matter how colorful the question, I might look into it for you. I'm Edgar B. Herbert III. Stay curious out there. Oh, tasty rainbow. <laughs> it's not vomit, it's a rainbow.